much, Lucrezia. Um, and thank you, Sophia, for your presentation. That was very clear and interesting. Um, let me set up the screen sharing. Okay, does that look like it's working? Okay. So, as mentioned, I am currently working on my dissertation. And in fact, I'm still in the final stages or next to final stages of crafting the proposal, which is just to say that my research is actively, I'm actively researching right now. So I am very excited to hear your um, ideas and questions as I present what I have so far. I'm working on essential being and um, essential being and its consequences. That has streamlined to be essential being, its scotist uh, parallels and its consequences, especially in the realm of aesthetics. So I do think that essential being has relevance to a lot of different areas of Stein's thought. But for the sake of being clear, especially in this presentation, but also in the dissertation, I've chosen to focus mainly on the aesthetic consequences of essential being. Okay, so the outline of what I'm gonna to present today is first, I will just give a little bit of background on why this topic of essential being, why I think it's important. Um, and I'll give a brief gloss of the theory of essential being focusing especially on what is not clear, what, what makes it difficult to understand this theory or to argue for it. Then I'm gonna reframe the theory, especially in light of some parallels with SCOTUS and the aesthetic dimensions. So I'm using this general term aesthetic dimensions. I'll make it more particular, but um, I just wanna note that I think Stein has quite an artistic sensibility that you wouldn't necessarily pick up on in some of her works. For instance, her metaphysical works, Potency and Act and Finite and Eternal Being, I would not call those particularly artistic works in terms, like she's not talking about art, but she does have a theory of, a set of artistic truth in Finite and Eternal Being. And whenever you read her letters, they're full of these references to the, um, music and literature that she was enjoying. So I wanna take her seriously and pay attention to the images that she chooses, the things that she chooses to say about art and her metaphysical work. All right, so to begin, why am I working on essential being? There are some scholarly reasons. Um, I think that essential being, along with her other metaphysics, is foundational to her other topics that she worked on. So she was obviously working a lot in education, both in her writing, but also in her actual teaching and teaching tra uh, training teachers. She wrote on women. Um, all of these different more concrete topics that she pays attention to are not separate from her metaphysical work. And I think that paying close attention to her metaphysics can clarify the foundation upon which she's writing a lot of her work on education and women and so forth. I also think that the topic of essential being is a particularly important hinge in her um, project of fusing phenomenology and metaphysics, particularly because there is a discussion about essences that um, was quite important in the early phenomenological world in which she was working. So Jean Herring, Husserl, Heidegger, they are all talking about essences. They all have different versions of essences. And of course, this is not the same. The phenomenological essence is not the same as the Thomistic essence. So if uh, Stein is going to fuse phenomenology and metaphysics, she of course has to clarify um, what the differences are between those different senses of essence. And she goes through that in a lot of detail, especially in chapter four of Finite and Eternal Being. Um, but I think that her 
overall theory of essential being, which is presented more in chapter three of finite and eternal being, uh, I think it also helps connect all of that more detailed work on essence. Another scholarly reason why I want to work on essential being is because Stein references SCOTUS throughout her discussion of essential being, but she doesn't go into detail. She says, oh, my position is probably closest to SCOTUS. And she mentions um, SCOTUS's theory of the kingship of Christ. And um, these are links that I think are fruitful to develop further as well as uh, the links between what she writes about essential being and what she writes about artistic truth. And lastly, um, her theory of essential being looks like some preceding theories. She compares it to Plato's forms. She compares it to Aquinas' divine ideas. Others have argued that it's a reprise of some theories that Henry of Ghent has or Scotus's theory of common nature. But the more that I have dug into these similarities, the more I've um, become convinced that Stein's theory of essential being is really a new contribution. She's um, offering something new to the continued discussion along the history of philosophy. So I think that's a good reason to work on it. There are also more philosophical reasons why I think essential being is important. And these aren't as obvious, but um, I think that it is, part of Stein's response to a Heideggerian type of relativism. So being um, finite and eternal being was written after Stein read Being and Time, and it has that appendix where she responds to it. And she was quite impressed with that, but also quite troubled by some of the premises that it argued for. And I think that her, um, her work on essential being grounds some of her responses to Heidegger's Being and Time. At the very least, I think it provides a more objective framework for understanding some of his claims um, that are quite convincing, specifically his claims about worldhood and the, the, self, the ego that constitutes a world. Um, I think that Stein is grappling with those ideas. They're in the background. Um, I also think that her theory of essential being does a great job articulating some aspects of what I would call aesthetic experience. Um, and as I mentioned before, artistic truth is one of those. I'll talk about that but also aesthetic experience in um, a more general way, um, which I would describe as the sort of encounter with intelligibility that is common to pretty much everybody, but is not always experienced in philosophical terms. So this apprehension of order in the world around us, I think that her theory of essential being puts words to that. And so I said that third point, intelligibility. Okay. Here's my quick gloss of essential being. Um, this is a mouthful, but if I could say it in one sentence, essential being is the hierarchical, ineffective, atemporal being of meaning. And as I said, this is mainly spelled out in chapter three of finite and eternal being. Um, there she very helpfully gives us a phenomenological account leading up to it. So she points out, um, she uses the example of joy. When you have an experience of joy, you can identify that experience, you can name, oh, I, I experienced joy in this particular context. But you can also identify that you are experiencing something that could happen in other contexts as well. You can remember that joy, you can think about, you can see joy in another person, you can try and understand that to a greater or lesser degree. And what she points out there is, okay, in my mind, I try to understand whatever it is that um, struck me in this experience. So I come up with a concept of joy, but underlying that is an essentiality that I don't form in my mind, but I instead encounter. And I encounter that essentiality through particular experiences wherein that essentiality is reflected. Um, but again, it's not, uh, it's not a concept that I, I, I'm not experiencing a concept that my mind has formed. I'm I'm experiencing something that I'm grasping that exists outside myself. So she compares it to Plato's forms. She says, we can think about essential being as a realm of meaning, sort of like Plato's forms. It's hierarchical. There's simple essentialities at the top. Things like, well, I think goodness would be one that would fall in there. 
a more interesting example or a more uh, helpful example perhaps would be she says you have complex essentialities like bittersweet but then you also have the simple essentialities of sweet and bitter and then down uh, towards the bottom of the hierarchy, you have the much more particular essentialities of things like, I don't know, dark chocolate, maybe that's a bittersweet thing, but it has bittersweet with some other uh, qualities as well. Unlike Plato's forms, though, essentialities are not creatively effective. So that's why that word ineffective is in my first description of it. The things that abide in essential being do not cause anything to be. There's no participation theory where my table is only a table because of participating in the essentiality of tableness. Instead, Stein talks about them as, in a way, the precondition for actual being. That's a confusing statement because it, again, sounds like it could be causal. I think that another way of understanding that without heading into the causal direction is essential being is the precondition of actual being insofar as it's intelligible. So actual being, the things that we interact with have intelligibility and essential being is that intelligibility. So it's hierarchical, it's ineffective, it's atemporal because it does not come into being and go out of existence. Some people have argued that essential being is infinite or sorry, is eternal. Um, I don't think that that's the case. I think that essential being is part of finite being and therefore is created. So it's not eternal in the sense that it's always existed, um, but it's atemporal because it doesn't abide by the laws of act and potency that we see in actual being. Perhaps the most important part of essential being that Stein emphasizes in her initial presentation of it is that it is something that we grasp, not something that we make. That is how she distinguishes it from mental being in particular. So she's really trying to show that essential being is not the same as actual being, it's not the same as mental being, and it's not the same as eternal being. But there are some aspects of her presentation that are not so clear. For example, she talks about it as a realm, and then in another passage she says, well, it's not really a kind of meaning, it's a component of, it's, it's not really a kind of being, instead it's a component of all being. So that we seem to have some, conflicting texts, some that say it is uh, a distinct realm and some that say it's maybe just uh, something that you can say about being, but not actually something separate. If it is a realm, if we say, if we understand essentialities as abiding or existing um, in a really full sense, then it seems like we would be reifying essentialities. We'd be making the things an essential being into too much of a thing to where we'd be uh, ending up with some kind of real being, some kind of actual being. That's not really what Stein's talking about when she says that essential being is non-actual. But there's a tension there. It's difficult to say what she means by calling essential being a realm, which she does throughout Planet and Eternal Being. It's like a shorthand um, to refer to essential being. The second question, and this one has been discussed more in the scholarship right now, is are essentialities divine ideas? Sarah Borden has made some convincing arguments that she does, that uh, Stein does ultimately ground essentialities as divine ideas. And there are some passages where it really sounds like Stein is saying that. But I don't think that this can be really what Stein means. Because if essentialities are the divine ideas, then they would be creatively effective. Since the divine ideas are, by definition, creatively effective. Everything is what it is because of the divine idea of it. But she defines essentialities as being ineffective. They're not creating anything. So there has to be a distinction there somehow. So the question, the ambiguity there is, all right, Stein closely relates essentialities to divine ideas. But is there a way of closely relating them without identifying the two as the same thing? If you identify the two as the same thing, then it seems that essential being would collapse into eternal being. And then we'd have some problems. Um, one of the problems here that I think is quite interesting is that Stein has the idea of individual forms. 
and um, she thinks that individuals, human individuals, can fail to live up to their uh, to their essence. So I have a Genevieve form that I more or less perfectly uh, achieve, more or less, in, as in my life. For Aquinas, that would be a problem if the if the form of Genevieve is the same as the divine idea of Genevieve, but I failed to live up to it then that would mean that God had a divine idea of me in his mind that did not perfectly, that was not perfectly adequate to the actual thing existing, which for Aquinas would um, imply that God is an imperfect artisan because his idea of the thing is not perfectly reflected in the artifact that he creates. So there's some interesting rabbit holes to go down there, but I'll move on to the third ambiguity, which is um, it might be easier to just interpret essential being as a category theory. So maybe she's not actually positing a whole other type of existence. Um, maybe she's using that language just to point out, okay, we can talk about the things that are, we can sort reality into buckets. We got the bittersweet bucket, the sweet bucket, the bitter bucket, and we can just start realizing how all these different categories of things are related. Um, the precedent for this would be building off of Husserl's ideas one, especially the first 16 paragraphs of that. Uh, and that Borden also says her, the essential being could be providing the groundwork for a category theory. So I think this is an interesting other interpretation of, of essential being, but I think that it has the problem of um, blurring the line between essential being and mental being. So a category theory, it, it's really easy to have a category theory without, um, without having anything other than mental being and actual being. So at that point, what are we talking about? So what we're looking for in order to clarify these questions is some account of essential being that clarifies how it's not extraneous. It's not just a superfluous thing that she's throwing into a metaphysical schema, um, but instead it's truly distinct and also illuminative as a metaphysical theory. So it has to clarify something. It has to do some work for her. Um, and I think that it does, but I think that obviously it, it gets confusing um, because of the reasons that I mentioned. So as I set out to look for this, I found surprising leads in um, some parallels between Stein and Scotus and uh, connections between Stein's work on aesthetics and essential being. I think it's worth mentioning, Borden points out in her companion to Find an essential being that uh, aesthetics is an underdeveloped area of Stein's work that pops up in finite and eternal being. And I agree with her on that. So I'll outline this new account of essential being. I think it's better framed if we understand Stein's ontology as mirroring the Trinity. So you have eternal being and finite being and finite being falls into three, actual, mental, and essential. So just as Stein has the threefold theory of the person, body, soul, and spirit, she's doing something similar with her um, metaphysics of finite being. She's finding three parts to it. But these aren't parts that can be separated. They're parts that are distinct but inseparable. So, um, Essential being would correspond most closely, I would say, to the son, the second person in the Trinity, because that is the divine word. That's where the divine ideas are. And thus the link that she draws again and again between divine ideas and essentialities. I'm not saying, I, I'm not, uh, I, don't, I don't mean to make a theological claim here um, because that's above my pay grade as a philosopher. I really, I would have to do a lot more research in theology. Um, but I do think that Stein often works in threes. And so this would be um, a helpful frame for understanding what she's doing with essential being. So what is essential being? Essential being is the totality of finite logos, of finite meaning and reason that mirrors the totality of meaning that is the divine logos. So the actual divine word that has all the divine ideas that is reflected imperfectly because finitely in essential being. So therefore essentialities are the ineffective reflections of the creatively effective archetypes in the divine mind that are the divine ideas. 
Why is this helpful? Because having a theory of essential being, um, rather than just having a particularly rich category theory, helps a, um, articulates the experience of intelligibility that comes in many forms. So when I'm talking about intelligibility, I'm saying, um, I think this is more clear in artistic examples and I'll talk about that soon. But what I wanna point out is I'm not talking about a logical analysis or deduction of some unity uh, behind reality. That might be part of it, but I'm more talking about an immediate sense of there's some, there's some like um, harmony here. Some sort of things are connected around us and we can't necessarily say how exactly, but we do experience that. So I'm gonna begin by looking at some of the SCOTUS parallels that uh, have drawn me toward this reading of essential being. People have, um, well, before saying that, I just want to point out, again, Stein does point to SCOTUS as being somebody or as having theories that her own theories are similar to. Um, and so I want to develop those links that she points out, but I also want to do that for the sake of showing how her account is original. It's not actually a reprise of SCOTUS. So that's why I said it's not SCOTUS, but it is SCOTUS scented. Um, so one of the links is common nature. SCOTUS's theory of common nature is uh, dealing with a similar ontological position as Stein's theory of essential being. So he says the nature of human, for example, exists not just in the humans that actually exist, nor just in the mind of people who understand what a human is, but in fact, there's some nature that has a less than numerical unity and it is common to those two. Now, that's a theory that has been discussed a lot within obviously SCOTUS scholarship. Um, and I wouldn't cast myself as an expert on this, but I think it is helpful because they are working on something similar. I do not think that SCOTUS's theory of common nature is the same as Stein's theory of essential being because Stein puts a lot of things in essential being. So she's not just having, there aren't essentialities just of substances. There are essentialities for joy and gold and um, bittersweet. So I think that that would push common nature too far for SCOTUS's comfort. There's also the SCOTUS idea of hachetas, which is, has been pointed to um, by others as uh, quite similar to Stein's theory of individuality. Um, and Alfieri wrote an excellent piece on that. I think that's interesting. I don't think it's quite as uh, related to essential being, but I think it would be, um, I think it's important to include, to at least show that we're aware of that. Um, another idea in SCOTUS is what's called convenientia, which is um, a sort of principle that he uses in his reasoning. It means fittingness. And he uses this, especially when he's making arguments about Mary, the Immaculate Conception and Christ. So he'll list a number of philosophical arguments for an answer to a question. Then I'll say, how do, we, how do we reason between these? Which one could be correct? And he doesn't end up turning to deductive reasoning to solve that, but he says, well, this one is very fitting. And so it's that kind of um, apprehension of something as harmonious in a way. And that in itself is a kind of reasoning that leads them to assert something. So uh, some scholars have developed this into a theory of what they call aesthetic rationality. And that is quite relevant to Stein, I think. And as a small note, um, my understanding, this is, a, this is one of the more recent developments in my research, but um, Baichkov was pointing out that SCOTUS has a strong emphasis on the Trinity and works in threes, which Stein also does. So what about the aesthetic dimensions of this? Stein's theory of artistic truth um, can be summarized as saying artistic truth is the measure to which a work of art 
accords with the pure form underlying its creation. She says, you know, think about a picture of Napoleon. A painting of Napoleon can do a really good job showing who the, the person of Napoleon was, even if it changes certain details that are historically inaccurate. And um, it can still show who Napoleon was, maybe better than a really particularly rich historical work that shows all of the details of what he did in his life does, because artists have this ability to show a pure form. What's interesting about this theory is that it presupposes some non-speculative grasp of objective intelligibility. Why do I say objective? Because Stein says that an artist can uh, achieve this, uh, like a, a work of art can show a pure form, even if the artist is not intending to show that pure form exactly. So my example that I think of is John Steinbeck. I love Steinbeck's novels. Um, he's working in an atheistic humanistic context, but I think that he does such a good job showing the human person. I think it depicts the, it depicts the human person so accurately that there's almost something about it that speaks toward the existence of divinity, even though he doesn't believe in that, he's not trying to show that. So here's another link between Stein and Scotus. Um, there's some kind of aesthetic rationality underlying her, uh, her theory of how we grasp forms, grasp pure forms. And in order to say what we're grasping, we have to create something like a theory of essential being. So I think her theory of essential being helps to show what's actually going on when we um, grasp the meaning of a work of art or when somebody creates a work of art that uh, is trying to articulate something that they experienced. Stein also talks a lot about how creation um, shows, uh, creation contains the image of the Trinity and the image of God. And she emphasizes that it reflects the Trinity imperfectly. So um, Levy wrote uh, an interesting article where he pointed out that Stein has um, a particular, a distinctively Jewish view of the world as a whole, of the created cosmos, as being um, sort of in exile. So there's a meaning that you can't quite access, but it is there. So it's an imperfectly reflected order. If we talk about, if we understand essential being as um, sort of the map of meaning that accords to the divine logos, but is imperfect because it's finite, then we've got some metaphysical um, tools for accounting for that, uh, for the way in which creation is a veiled mirror of the word of the um, divine intelligibility. And um, whenever Aquinas talks about the divine ideas, he uses a lot of artistic analogies. So God as a divine artisan. Stein also talks about how human creativity imperfectly mirrors divine creativity. Um, and she discusses that when she's talking about individual forms, um, you know, I think it's particularly well shown in her discussion of literary creation. So when a writer such as Homer writes the Iliad, he's creating a world and the characters have some kind of essence. We can talk about the essence of Achilles. We're like, would he do this? Would he do that? Because the character of Achilles has some nature that, um, is not all the way unfolded in his actions in the story. You can imagine Achilles doing other things because there's some something that it is to be Achilles that's particular. And Stein says, okay, that world creating thing where things have essences that unfold imperfectly, that's a great analogy for understanding how essences actually operate in um, creation as a whole with God as a divine artisan. So again, I think that essential being, because it has an account of intelligibility that's not just philosophical, not just logical, but some kind of grasp of a harmonious whole, I think that puts words to how it is that, that human creativity mirrors divine creativity. So back to the question, why essential being, sort of summarizing this, um, it gives a fine-grained account of intelligibility, fine-grained because it has, um, because it's hierarchical. There's a way of isolating, okay, here's the, here's this particular shade of blue 
that particular shade of blue is not just existing by itself, but it's actually connected to a whole bunch of other colors and a whole bunch of meaning and emotions and whatever. Um, it kind of, uh, I think thinking of it as Plato's realm does, as Plato's ideas does help, like give a helpful mental image for saying um, how this one thing that I'm able to really articulate in this instance seems to be relevant to a whole bunch of other things, even though I couldn't really say how right now. Um, I think essential being provides a framework for understanding that. And I also think once you are able to talk about the interrelation of these essentialities and essences in essential being, then you've got some, um, some traction when you're talking about especially individual human nature. So how is it going, I'll just use myself an example as an example again, how is it that I am an individual Genevieve, also a human and a woman and blonde and all these other things. Um, Stein's work so much in types. I think that she's so closely attuned to the various levels of um, order that we can identify within a single individual thing, but those aren't, um, those aren't like a causal kind of order. It's not that I am made to be this way because I am blonde and blue eyed and all these other things. It's just that there's some relevance and interconnection of things. Um, I also think that essential being is linked to education, but I'm gonna move on because I think I'm at the end of my time here. Uh, I didn't use this word throughout my presentation, but it's worth mentioning Stein has, she uses this word or concept phrase thought worlds a lot. When she's describing her own project, she says, oh, I needed to find a way to um, fuse the, the worlds of Husserl and Aquinas within my own self. Um, and she writes about the thought world of an artist, the thought world of a philosopher. When she's talking about a thought world, she's talking about the collection of concepts that have been unified by that person. And when we understand a concept in contrast to an essentiality, then we can understand a thought world as a more or less complete reflection of essential being, which is an ordered whole of all meaning. So thought worlds grasp that to greater or lesser degrees, and they do that in not necessarily philosophical ways. You can have thought worlds that are extremely relevant, but that are you know, literary or artistic. So I think that's a helpful, um, I think I just think she articulates that well. And why have essential, why posit essential being as a theory? I think Stein would say because it's fitting. It would be fitting for um, finite being to reflect the Trinity in this way. Okay, so thank you. Um, thank you to everybody who organized this and I look forward to hearing all of your responses in this bibliography.